Well, I'm so excited to be back and sharing with you guys. Did you guys appreciate our four-week mission series? That was awesome. What a great time. I want to say, he's not up here. This is what he does. Jake Smith, who is our Go, Go Global director, is serving down, I think, in the infant nursery today on Father's Day. And so when you see him, will you thank him for leading us through um, he's just been a great servant and helping us make new connections and kind of rekindle the fire around uh, global missions. And he did a great job, introduced us to some great new people. And I'm just so excited to be able to be back. I haven't, been, I haven't shared with you from the pulpit since the Sunday before Mother's Day, if you can believe it or not. So it's been six weeks or so, five weeks since we've been able to talk together. So I'm excited to share with you today. And we're starting a new series. I got to tell you, I've been, for the last several years, I've just been on a kind of a journey of rediscovery around who the Holy Spirit is, um, both personally and then over these last several months as your pastor. It's just been a season of me going back into scripture and allowing other teachers to kind of just refresh my view on the Holy Spirit. And I've been so excited. We've been talking about this with our, with our elders, your leaders, we've been talking about this, and I just feel the time is right to take some time as a church and just slow everything else down. I know we're getting into summer, but to slow everything else down and just recalibrate a little bit. Can we do that? Can we just take some time and slow down? It's been a season of the Lord just recentering my thoughts around who the Holy Spirit is and even kind of recalibrating some of my theology. And I'll tell you why in just, in just a minute. But we talk about this. I just used this a phrase a little bit ago when I gave the announcements talking about us being an outreach-oriented church. Your elders, your leaders, we've been talking about the vision of our church. And we put the vision of our church in three very simple phrases. We want to be an outreach-oriented. That means reaching people that aren't in these walls, reaching people for Jesus. We want to be discipleship-dedicated, which means becoming more and more like Jesus, learning more about the Bible and allowing him to change us from the inside out. But there's a third one that I think we really need to wrestle with. And we've talked a little bit about it, but it's been a very long time since we've talked about it on a Sunday morning. And that is what it means to be a spirit-filled church. The vision of our church is to be an outreach-oriented, discipleship-dedicated, spirit-filled church. And so we need to take time to talk about that. I want to wrestle through that. That's the question, is what does it mean to be a spirit-filled church in the 21st century. Just in our recent history, back in November and December, uh, November and January, actually, Pastor Bruce and I, we did a Wednesday night class. We probably had 25 people join us as we just went to Scripture and just looked, what, it, what do we need to learn about the Holy Spirit? And we put a very simple question in front of us before we went to Scripture. And the question was just very simply this. Is it possible, is it remotely possible that God, the creator of the universe, creator of all things, might work in, in a way in which we are not initially comfortable or in a way we've never heard of or personally experienced? How would you answer that question today? Would you say, yeah? That's the lens. That's the lens I want to go into the scriptures and start looking at who is the Holy Spirit? What's the role of the Holy Spirit? And actually, in order to do that, we have to take several steps back and build a foundation. So the format on Sundays are going to look, look a lot different than what it looked like in those classes because it was very interactive and we were reading scripture together and just kind of throwing thoughts out there. And of course, you know, I'm going to be sharing what, what I'm finding um, but the, the goal of the time is exactly the same, and that's recalibrating, refreshing, and getting a new understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. And, and the reality, there's kind of a reality check that just happened for just about every one of us in the room. And you're going to have a reaction to me saying those things. And we're going to refresh and get a new understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. Every one of us in this room just had a reaction to that statement. And it comes from our past, our past experiences. You're hearing me talk about the Holy Spirit or talk about being a spirit-filled church and you have a reaction to those phrases. And it's, it's going to be, a, I, can, I couldn't capture everybody's reaction, but I'm going to generalize to five different reactions here. Number one, there's probably those in this room that we're here say, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and being a spirit-filled church, that you're saying, yes, we're finally talking about something I'm really excited about, and I know a lot about, and I'm going to have my feelings and views validated. Like, that's a good thing. That's okay. That's a good thing. 
Some of you in the room might have a reaction of, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. My teaching that I grew up with was that the work of the Holy Spirit ended when the apostles died off back in the first century. And that's a, that's a valid view. We're going to talk about that. And very honestly, there's a number of us in, in this room that are carrying spiritual and emotional baggage from teaching and practices of the Holy Spirit. Can we just be honest about that this morning? We've seen bad teaching. We've seen bad theology. We've seen bad practices, or we've seen goofy things, or we maybe even see some really ridiculous things on TV, and we can't reconcile those things. Can we just acknowledge that some of us probably have that baggage? There's also probably a group here that says, you know, I've heard, I've heard that phrase, I've seen the words Holy Spirit in Scripture, but I don't know really anything about it. And you go even one step further, there's probably you going, I have literally never heard that phrase before. This is my first time hearing it. Or when I see it in scripture, I just skip right past it and I haven't paid any attention to it. I think all of us probably fit somewhere in the spectrum of those five reactions. I want to show you something in the book of Acts. It's a great couple of little verses. If you haven't read Acts, Luke and then the book of Acts, the gospel writer Luke puts together a kind of a part one, part two, the history of Jesus and then the history of the early church. Take a look at these verses and see if maybe some of us can relate to this. While Apollos was in Corinth, the apostle Paul traveled through the interior regions. He's talking about Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, until he reached the city of Ephesus. Remember, we spent a lot of time in the book of Ephesians, haven't we? That's on the coast where he found several believers or disciples, people who have started following Jesus. And Paul asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And look at the response. He, they said, no, we haven't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. So this is actually a perspective in the Bible where people don't know, have an experience. They believe in Jesus, they follow him, but they have no idea who the Holy Spirit is. Each of us are walking and walking in with, and walking through different ideas, different thoughts, beliefs, preconceived ideas. And can I even go so far as to say misconceptions about who the Holy Spirit is or what it means to be spirit-filled, what it means to be a Pentecostal church or even who the Holy Spirit is. And what can happen is we can wind up basing all of our theology of the Holy Spirit around maybe one section of Scripture or one verse in Scripture or maybe even one personal experience, either positive or negative, and miss out on the complete picture of who the Holy Spirit is. And so here's what I'm asking. Before we dive into the message for today, here's what I'm asking. That no matter where in that spectrum of five things, no matter where we find ourselves in the view, the theology, the practice of the Holy Spirit, here's the ask. Even if you've been hurt, Here's the ask. Can we let our guard down for the next several weeks? Can we set aside our preconceived ideas and our misconceptions? Can we make, can we make the stand that we're not going to assume we know everything about the Holy Spirit? But rather that over these next six weeks that we would go on a journey through Scripture together, that we would commit to be together for these next six weeks and go to Scripture and find out what these words, what the context is, what's happening in Scripture, and find out who the Holy Spirit is. And truly allow God in a fresh, new way to work in us, both as individuals and as the church. My hope is, my goal, my hope, my prayer for you is that we can maybe debunk some bad teaching and debunk some bad practice and really get to the heart of who this Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit wants to work in our church. Can we agree on that together today? Can we commit to that? It's, a, it's kind of a risky thing, isn't it? To kind of set these things aside and step into something that's maybe new or maybe that's something that God wants to refresh. But I, I really believe that's where he wants to go this morning. So these next six weeks, that's where we're heading. Sound good? Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for meeting us in this place today. And Lord, over these next several weeks, as we focus on your word, as we focus on the person of the Holy Spirit. We pray, just like we sang earlier, that you would open heaven and you would reveal things to us. Will you open scripture? Will you illuminate it in a fresh and in a new way so we can gain just a true scriptural balanced understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and what he's all about? Lord, we ask you to meet us in this place. 
We give all of ourselves to you in worship. This time together in your word is worship. And we give it to you freely and gladly. And we pray this in your name. Everybody say amen. Amen, amen. I'm so glad the kids are with us today. This is going to look a little bit different than most normal weeks. Um, But in order to have a a good understanding of who the Holy Spirit is, in order to start having the conversation and finding out, well, who is the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? What are these things in Scripture? You know, the book of Acts, basically through the end of the book, is the story of the Holy Spirit at work in the early church. And so in order to gain an understanding and really get a good, solid foundation for these next several weeks, we actually have to take a number of steps back. And so if it's okay, we're going to kind of go to Sunday school this morning for a little while. Is that all right with everybody? Make it simple. I don't have a flannel graph board. I almost brought one in, but I've got something for the kids that they're going to love. It's going to be fantastic. But in order to to build a good foundation, we're going to start at square one, and we're going to talk about the Trinity. I hope you got your note sheet as you walked in the door this morning. You feel free to take notes. We're going to be moving pretty quickly. Um, but we're just going to put a basic understanding of who, the, of who the Trinity is. Each person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have very specific roles in our faith. They've played specific roles all throughout Scripture, and they continue to play specific roles in our lives today. So we're going to spend our time going to Sunday school and learning about the Holy Trinity. Sound good? Come on, it's Sunday school. Let's have Sunday school together. It's going to be a great time. We're going to talk about God the Father for a few minutes. That's your first line there, number one, God the Father. Can you guess what two and three are going to be? Here we go. We're going to keep things simple today. Here we go. God the Father. Jewish society at the time of the Bible, especially in times of the Old Testament, the father in the household was the most important person in, in basically for that family, the most important person in the world. And I love that we're going to talk about God the Father today on Father's Day. It works out so well. The father was the head of an extended family that resided with him. It wasn't like how we, how we have, you know, just, well, I'm going to have my, my four and no more, right? You're talking about extended families. And they're tracing back lineage through grandparents and great-grandparents. You see it all throughout Scripture. So-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so. These large groups of people, large families that are staying together. They're tracing their uh, descendants all through these, from patriarch to patriarch. The father was meant to be honored and to be obeyed. And actually, there were really serious infractions if you disobeyed your father, especially in Old Testament times. I mean, even up to the point of kind of scary, but up to the point of capital punishment for disobeying your father. But the father had very specific roles in Jewish society. And guess what, dads? They're not too different today. So perk up. This is your Father's Day message right here. A father's job was to love and to care for his children, to provide for their needs, to take care of their family. A father was to discipline and instruct their kids in what faith looked like, especially in the Old Testament the, in Jewish society, they were the father or grandfather or great-grandfather, depending on the shape of the extended family. Their job was to officiate over religious ceremonies that were held in the household. Think of Passover meals and things like that. The father or the grandfather, the great-grandfather was the patriarch was who presided over those events. He provided for his children's futures in two really specific ways. Fathers had inheritances that they set aside for their sons, and they paid huge dowries for their daughters to secure their futures after he passed away. And there was something so beautiful in Jewish society of how they kind of pre-planned to take care of widows and orphans. The fatherless were very important in Jewish society. And the reason why it was so important, that spiritual heritage was so important, is because they understood who God the Father was to them. They modeled their homes off of the picture of God the Father. All of these things that I just read are the same roles that God the Father play in us today. He provides for, his, they prov- he provides for their needs. He takes care of their children. He provides a spiritual inheritance. It's so important, we can't understate it. Actually, there's a section of scripture in Deuteronomy where uh, the the Lord through Moses is giving some commands on how to take care of families. And we've actually adopted this for our family life ministries. Pastor Michelle has put this in front of us a number of times. But look at Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 through 9. Again, this is the Lord through Moses 
giving the command. It says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Look at this. He says, repeat them again and again to your children. Pass on this spiritual legacy from God the Father. Talk about the, these commands when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The reason these things were so important to Jewish fathers, they understood that relationship with God the Father. Yahweh was revered as the father of Israel. He was to be honored and obeyed. He cared for the children of Israel. He disciplined them a lot, right? He disciplined them a lot. He passed down commands and teachings to help them understand that he's holy and they were not. He was called the father to the fatherless. There's a great Psalm, Psalm 68. Father to the fatherless, defender of the weak. He takes spiritual orphans and makes them part of his family. He provides a spiritual inheritance for all his children. And we teach our children and our families his ways because we want to honor his legacy. God the Father has a very specific role in our lives. And here's the hard part talking about this on Father's Day is that there's a lot of people who have misconceived ideas on who, the, who God the Father is based on their views of their own father. We see God the Father, especially those of us who have strained relationships or hurtful relationships, maybe even no relationship with our fathers. We see judgment. We see shame. We see beat down. We see punishment. But a true God the Father's role is so specific. It's 180 degrees opposite. It's love. It's not this hammer punishment. There's discipline. Yes, there's discipline because he's holy and we're not. And he's trying to correct us. But the role of God the Father in our lives is love. The entirety of scripture is that story. God's love for us. And how he changed the course of human history by sending his son. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Yes, he disciplines us and teaches us. Yes, God the Father is fully holy and he is fully righteous. Yes, the law was given to point out, to demonstrate how sinful mankind was. That there was a gap caused by sin and he gave very specific requirements on what it was going to look like to reconcile that gap. But something far greater was given because of God's love for us. The role of God the Father in our lives is love. God the Father loves us, and that love took a very specific form in the second of person of the Trinity, God the Son. God the Son. We have four Gospels, four books of the Bible, which is story after story, account after account of Jesus teaching people that he was the way, he was the truth, and that he was the life. He was the one that was changing everything. No longer was it about law, but it was about Grace, he was God incarnate on earth, teaching people what God's love really was all about. We know this verse so well. John 3, 16. I added verse 17 as well because it's so powerful. It says, that for God, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus was asked this question a number of times. He understood that people were going to wonder, well, what, if he's there to fulfill the law, you, you see these conversations, well, law and grace, the struggle and you know, the people of his time, and guess what? We still struggle with that conversation a bit today too. But if you ever want to read a great gospel, just sit down and just reread the book of John. John is just spot on when it comes to Trinitarian um, theology and getting a good picture of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But look at John 5, 17. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their, pur their purpose. Everything that the law pointed to, the law pointed to people are sinful and here's all the different ways that they're sinful. And because of their sin, we, here's the system of sacrifice and system of atonement and all these things that have to happen in order for people to be reconciled with God. And Jesus comes on the scene and he changes the complete story. How? He not only 
he just complete, he fulfills the law. All of those requirements are done and they're taken care of. God loved people so much that he sent his son to die for them. The role of God the Father in our lives is love. God the Father loves us. That love took the form of the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. The role of God the Son in our lives is salvation. Bless you. God the Son saves us through Jesus. The fulfillment of the Old Testament system of sacrifice for sin was paid in full for all mankind, for all time. I told you we were going to Sunday school today, didn't I? This is, I mean, we, in order to understand now this third person of the Trinity, we have to understand these first two roles. That God the Father's role is not to judge. God the Father's role is not to hammer us down. God the Father's role is to send love. That love took the form of Jesus. Jesus' role is to save us. And God the Holy Spirit. Well, that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time today in these next five weeks after today. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? And to get a, a good picture of the Holy Spirit, I actually have to dip into a little bit of the science of biblical interpretation. Are you ready? It's awesome. It's fun stuff. I want to show you two things here real quick. Scholars, as they're reading the original text of, of the scriptures, they have to make decisions based on the original language and come up with the best interpretation, the best intent of scripture. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Who's fluent in Hebrew in here? So we're dependent on people making correct interpretations or correct, you know, they're, they're trying to pull the original intent of the meaning from, this, from the scripture writers. The New Testament is written in Greek. Who's fluent in Greek? Ben Kronz. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> There's always one and it's usually him. So let's take a look at this. I want to show you something. You guys ready to get your Hebrew on? Here we go. Let's look at this. Here's the Hebrew word. We're going to talk about the Hebrew word for spirit. It's the word ruach. Can you say that? Everybody say it. Ruach. ruach. Yeah, you got to get like that phlegm in the throat thing going. Maybe I'll do this teaching in January next year when half of us are sick. <laughs> ruach. And you're reading it from right to left, by the way. So don't read it the other way. And it's, word gets really messed up when you start backspacing and you're thinking it's going to go, this, well, for you, it's going to go this way and it starts going this way. It's awesome. Ruach. Well, it's a very simple word. And this is the word that is translated spirit in the Old Testament in Hebrew. You know what the definition of this word is? Check it out. It's wind. It's breath. And yes, it's spirit. So every time that this word ruach appears in scripture, it can be translated one of these three ways. Take a look at this scripture, Genesis 1-2. We know the creation account so well. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We'll look at verse 2. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the spirit of God, the ruach of God, was hovering over the surface of the waters. That's the word right there in Hebrew. Ruach. Let's take a look at Greek. Who knows the Greek word? I know there's a couple of you do. Pneuma. The word pneuma. Guess what it means? It means wind, and it means breath, and it means spirit. It's the same definition, just a different language. So every time that this word pneuma appears in scripture, it's referring to wind or breath, or it's used in, to personify, to help us understand who the Holy Spirit is. Look at John chapter 6, verse 63. The spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. The very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Both of those two words, spirit, in, those, in that verse is the word pneuma. The pneuma, the wind, the breath alone gives eternal life. The words I have spoken to you are breath and life. See how awesome that is? And they understood, the people who were interpreting scripture understood that Jesus wasn't just referring to it wasn't just an exhalation, right? That's actually one of the definitions is the exhalation of breath. It's spirit. It's this presence. And so he's trying to, do, Jesus is trying to help us understand a biblical principle by using words that we might be able to understand. It's really simple. We understand for the word wind, spirit, breath, however you want to use that, that wind is powerful, right? We try to harness wind to, to transfer it into power. The Dutch have been doing it for centuries with their windmills, right? Windmills to grind up flour, to do whatever. We capture this power, this unseen power, right? I need a volunteer. I need one kid right now. Ready? Three, two, one. Okay, come on up, Lydia. 
I have, a, I have a job for you. Are you ready? Are you ready to go to work? Okay, here's what it is. I need you to go outside, and I need you to change the direction of the wind. <laughs> Can you do that? I think it's blowing this way. I need it to go that way. Can you do that? <laughs> how, how are you going to do that? How are you going to change the wind? I know, right? It's so hard. Give it up for Lydia, everybody. Come on. You can go sit down. That's awesome. You can't control the wind. As hard as you try, you might be able to harness it, but you can't change it. It goes where it wants. It does what it wants. There's a reason why these words were used is to help us understand a spiritual principle. The Holy Spirit is powerful. The Holy Spirit is uncontrollable. Maybe unpredictable. It's definitely unseen. Only a couple instances in Scripture do you actually see the Holy Spirit, right? The day of Pentecost, which we're going to talk about next week. A wonderful picture of Jesus' baptism when the heaven opens up and there's a picture of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the same moment together. It's a very rare thing, but the Holy Spirit is unseen. But you know one of the best things about wind? It's refreshing. I know there's a family that had their air conditioning go out this week. A nice cool breeze does a wonders on a hot day, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit is there to help refresh us. I have on the back of your note sheet, I hope you take some time this week to read three chapters. I want you to read chapters, John chapters 14, 15, and 16. And in those three chapters, you will find the brilliance of Jesus in helping us understand the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to do many things, but specifically to teach us all things, remind us of the things that Jesus said, to testify, to prove out Jesus, to convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. It speaks for Jesus. He guides us in all truth, and he brings glory to Jesus. I want to read just a couple of scriptures from that section that I hope will tantalize you enough to start going on this journey with me. But look at John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Jesus unpacks the role of the Holy Spirit for us. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Uh, the Greek definition for this word, it's the word paraclete. It means comforter or encourager, counselor or helper. It's that, that sense of the word. Give you another helper who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. See the, the hint of the unseen right there? But you know him because he lives with you now. In that moment, it was the person of Jesus. And later, it will be in you. We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. Look at verse 26. Again, Jesus. When the Father sends the advocate as my representative, we're going to come back to that verse in a minute because we just got the Trinity spelled out for us by Jesus right here. When the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I told you. But not only did Jesus intend to send the Holy Spirit, he also said that the Holy Spirit was a good thing. It was a good thing. Look at chapter 16, verse 7. I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor or advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And Jesus' last words on earth, his last recorded words on earth were about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts in verse 8. It says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The church has been given a mission, and it's one that we can't accomplish on our own. The Holy Spirit is our advocate, our helper, our counselor. So the role of God the Father in our lives is love. God the Father loves us, and that love took the form of the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. The role of God the Son in our lives is salvation. God the Son saves us. Through Jesus, the fulfillment of the Old Testament system of sacrifice for sin was paid in full. 
for all mankind and for all time. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to simply be with us. With us as helper, as companion, as friend. The Holy Spirit reminds us of God's teachings. It illuminates scripture and opens our eyes to truth and is the source of power for witness and ministry. The Godhead three in one. We use that phrase all the time. So we're going to spend just a couple more minutes as our time is wrapping up. I told you we're going to Sunday school. I don't have a flannel graph, but I want you to take a look at the, at the screen. Here's my version of a flannel graph, okay? Here we go. The God had three in one. We have three persons of the Trinity and all equally God at the same time. The Father is God. The Son is God. You can go to the next one for me, Logan. Thank you. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. This is a mystery we will never be able to understand, but I had something revealed to me this week that is so amazing it's going to blow your minds. <laughs> Look at this. We have to understand that because the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, but they are separate. The Father sent the Son, right? We heard the, 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 oh, the, the, new, the, the King James Version of John 3.16 only begotten son. Jesus, the son, was given. God the father is the giver. Therefore, the father is not the son. And the son is not the Holy Spirit because the son had to go away in order for the Holy Spirit to come. God, the father, is God. The son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But they are not each other. So let's go to the next one, Logan. And I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I, I see things. I see things. And so I know we have one chemist in the room here. Does anybody see anything on this? This is called a trigonal planal planar, planar, right? Molecule. It's three in one. Technically, that's four atoms in a molecule. But it holds up. That is a sulfur trioxide molecule. It is one molecule, but it's made up of three different things. You just had your chemist, chemistry lesson for the day. And it wasn't even from our resident chemist. But if you're like me, you see something else when you take a look at that. You see the flux capacitor. <laughs> which is what makes time travel possible. No? Isn't that awful? I'm sitting there the other day and I'm studying and I had this revelation. I've seen this before. Oh, thank you, Doc Brown. But honestly, I, I realize there's kids in the room today and I realize that as I get older, my references become, shall I say, more experienced. And so I needed something today because I knew I had kids in the room that I needed kids to grasp the concept of what we're talking about, three in one. And I told you I had it, and your mind is going to be blown. Are you ready for it? Here it is. The Holy Spirit is not unlike a fidget spinner. Do you know why I sat on the music stand this whole time? Because I totally would have fiddled with it the entire service. You love it or hate it? It works. There are three bearings in this thing. And this thing is not a fidget spinner, four bearings, unless these bearings are all doing their job. But together they are one fidget spinner. The Holy Spirit isn't unlike a fidget spinner. I told you. I told you. Actually, I warned you. I warned you. I'm going to put that right there, because guess what's going to happen if I, don't put it, if I put it in my pocket? The Godhead three in one. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They are three, yet they are one. It's a mystery. We're not going to reconcile it. We're just trying to understand it. But we understand they each have specific roles in our life. I love church history. There's a great creed all throughout the early church. 
First century, second century, third century, fourth century, as scripture was being canonized, as, they, as church leaders decided on what was going to be scripture throughout the ages, there were councils that met all throughout the area. And there's a council that happened in the city of Constantinople. You know where that is? That's modern day Istanbul, Turkey. In the year 381 AD, the church leaders came up with a creed to help them understand the person of the Trinity. Outside of the Bible, this is one of the first references of the work of the Holy Spirit and the role that each person in the Trinity plays. And here's what they wrote. We believe in one God, the Father, all-powerful maker of heaven and earth and of all things both seen and unseen. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten from the Father before all the ages, light from light, true God from true God. And here's key, begotten, not made. They realized that Christ was given, not created. Consubstantial with the Father, through whom all things came to be. You know what that means? The Father gave Jesus the power to create everything. For us humans, he came for salvation. He came down from the heavens and became incarnate from the Holy Spirit. There's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit. Became incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. Became human and was crucified on our behalf under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and rose up on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he went up into the heavens and is seated at the Father's right hand. He is coming again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And in the spirit, the holy, lordly, life-giving one, proceeding forth from the Father, co-worshipped and co-glorified with the Father and Son, the one who spoke through the prophets. They believe in one holy, catholic, apostolic church. That's not the, just the catholic church. That word is lower, lowercase c, the global church, one global church. We confess one baptism for the forgiving of sins, and we look forward to a resurrection of the dead and life in the age to come. Amen. God the Father loves us. God the Son saves us. And God the Holy Spirit is with us. They are three, yet they are one. And they are still at work today. And so we're going to spend the next five weeks just exploring scripture together. Can we have an honest conversation about theology, about the Bible, about the practice of the Holy Spirit? And understand we're not talking about a what, we're talking about a who. We're talking about a person of the Trinity who has will, who has mind, who as we're gonna see in scripture has emotion. It's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit, to hurt the Holy Spirit. But yet this is a person of the Trinity who is to be worshiped and who is to be Adored, And so I would like to go back to where we began today and just simply ask you to be open to going on this journey with us for these next weeks. Will you allow God the Father who loves us to prove his love for us again? He sent his son, Jesus, to earth to die on a cross for us. God the Son who saves us, will you allow Jesus to come and to meet you, the Son of God, the one who lived the perfect life to be the payment for your sins and my sins. And will you allow the God, the Holy Spirit, to come and be with us? Jesus, after returning to heaven, sent another to empower and embolden his church. And we're going to talk about this for the next few weeks. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about Pentecost. We're going to talk what, about what Pentecost Sunday means, what happened on the day of Pentecost. And we're going to see the brilliance of Jesus and the brilliance of God, the Holy Spirit, and how the Old Testament aligns with the New Testament and aligns with today. It's going to be amazing. And I want to go on this journey with you. So can we do that together? Amen? Amen. Six weeks, five more weeks. Be here. Let's go on this journey together. I want to close today. Uh, I want to pray, but I want to read to you a benediction. Don't put this on the screen, Logan, not quite yet. I want to read to you a benediction. Paul understood who the Holy Spirit was and how the Holy Spirit worked. 
And he prayed a benediction over one of the churches. And it's going to show you how he believed that each, pe- each person in the Trinity had a specific role. And he prayed it over his church. I would like to use his words today to pray over you. Can I do that today? May the grace, the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship, the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Jesus, this has been a beautiful, a beautiful time together. Holy Spirit, you have been so present here today. It's almost tangible, your work today. As you've illuminated scripture, as you've showed us things, as you have worked through, even working through Esther this morning to speak out over our church today. And especially today on Father's Day, as we pray to you, Father, we thank you for your unfailing love for us. Love that sent that second person of the Trinity, your son. We don't, we don't understand all this. We can't, we can't wrap our minds fully around this three-in-one thing. Someday I'm going to ask you about it. But Father, through your Holy Spirit, will you fill us today with knowledge of your love? And I want to pray specifically over every single one of us. We have something very, very similar today. We all have fathers, we all have mothers, and we're all in different places in our relationships with each of them. And today being Father's Day, Jesus, we look to you. Will you pray on our behalf to God the Father today? Will you bring healing? Will you bring wholeness to those who need it? Will you help us reach out and connect with fathers, maybe that have caused hurt, maybe that have caused wounds? But Lord, we know our spiritual legacy through you is one of love, is one of forgiveness, is one of acceptance, and is one of friendship. And so we thank you for your work in this church today. This is your church. And so we ask you to lead us from this day forward. Everyone say amen. Amen. Happy Father's Day to all of our dads, to all of our granddads. We've got uh, those root beers for you. Uh, I'm going to ask, hang on kids, I'm going to ask that you let your dads go first. We're going to start with 18 and up. If there's leftovers, we'll figure it out. But there's only like 72 bottles of them out there. So I don't know how that's all going to work out. Can't wait to be with you next Sunday. Have a great Father's Day. It looked like it turned out to be a beautiful day. I'm putting my fidget spinner in my pocket. God bless you guys.